and um, but there's nobody, there's nobody that has a style quite like Dr. Frank Sabatino who's got that next. Frank, I wish, I just wish I could move like Frank moves. <laughs> style all on his own, and women just kind of swoon, and even some guys I think just envy as to what would happen here. But really, you know, Frank is not just a good dancer and a good presenter, but Frank is really in the in the in the pantheon of the modern day plant-based movement leaders. Again, I said last night, we were all talking about Caldwell Esselstyn and Gilbert Hart and these people. Frank, like Alan Goldham, and that were doing these long before all of them were doing. Frank's been in this business, been water fasting and leading people on a whole food plant-based natural hygiene diet, as we all still call it. Um, for over, what, 40 years, Frank? Something like that. Um, he is as grounded in our health program as anybody you'll find. He, unfortunately, he's been in our conferences every year for as long as I can remember, except last year, where an unfortunate set of circumstances kept him there. I just had him at a, like we talked yesterday briefly about this Eat Smart Live Long Club in Hilton Head, South Carolina. So they've had Chef AJ and they've had other speakers that I brought down there. Well, last year, uh, this past April, I think, I brought Frank. 540 people <laughs> swooned to Franklin 17. He was really the best speaker they've ever had down there. And I don't want to build him up too bad so that he you know, lets you down here, but he won't. He won't. Without further ado, Dr. Frank 17. Yeah. done a special deal on behalf of Frank and his boss. So when you're done, you have one more thing to tell you. Pardon. We're just going to create a little bit more stage space so we can move for take care of everybody on all sides of the room if we can. Is that volume? Can you hear it way in the corner, way back? Yes? No? Okay. Good morning. Good it's a real pleasure for me to be here. I'm, I'm actually very delighted uh, being able to hook up with some of the docs that I haven't seen in such a long time. And uh, many friends from the past. And I have to tell you honestly, it's been an absolute inspiration, even in just this day. Louder, please. Louder, please. Okay. There's my man. <laughs> what Mark didn't tell you is that in Hilton Head, the entire audiovisual system blew out. So I had to entertain like stand up. <laughs> he didn't tell you that. No, but it's been an inspiration to uh, see some uh, friends from the past. And the inspiration is to see how, how beautiful and how healthy and how productive they have maintained after all these years. That's really an inspiration for me. And I want to just tell you that. It's been great. Uh, let me ask you a question before we begin. Is anybody in the room at all concerned? with how you're aging and getting older. Anybody in the room at all? <laughs> Have I got a story for you? Um, and this is a really important story to me. It gets closer to my heart as the years pass. I've all of a sudden become one of the elder statesmen of hygiene. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> uh, but the bottom line is, um, we have a population, as you well know, of people who basically live in fear, shackled to a shopping list full of medications that are hurting them across time, uh, watching their bodies in demise physically, cognitively, and in fear, wondering what's going to happen next. And I'm here to tell you that that's not the way it has to be. Um, this, is a, this is a picture of a 101-year-old woman from Scandinavia wow. who decided to throw caution to the wind, so to speak. <laughs> and jump out of a plane to fulfill some bucket list that you probably had. Um, I'm going to take you by the hand, if you will, and let me tell the story that I want to tell today, and we're going to take this leap together as we go out into space. Because you're going to see that the best that science has to offer in relationship to the science of aging is actually mimicked and far surpassed by adopting a plant-based whole food lifestyle. And not only that, by adding a few other pieces of lifestyle that we'll talk about and that I'll embellish a little bit in the talk that I do tomorrow morning. But one of the major hypotheses in the science of aging has become known as what we call the damage hypothesis. 
And what it says is this, that it's not only important how old you are, what becomes incredibly important is what kind of damage you have created in the years that you are. So you can be fairly old at 40 or fairly young at 60, depending on factors of damage and change. And that, of course, relates to lifestyle choice, lifestyle choices that you and I are making. Um, so there, there is a difference between chronological and biological age. You can be young at 60, old at 40. So chronologically, you have a certain age, but what you are able to do biologically can be quite different. And that makes it a difference between mean and maximum lifespan in the field of aging. Maximum lifespan in all species is typically genetically determined. So they'll look at an animal, any species, and say genetically they have this length of life. We have human beings that have lived to the age of 120 or so, so they typically will talk about that as being a maximum lifespan. Mean lifespan is the average that a person achieves in that community or culture, and that's affected by factors of infant mortality and stresses of the environment and things that compromise their ability to survive. So the mean lifespan in the United States will be very different than it is in certain parts of rural Africa or other parts of the world. But our maximum lifespan is pretty much the same. So it gets you, hits you home with that idea that those factors of lifestyle, environment, and change will modify just how far we can go in age. But in our culture, we have a difference. There's a difference between disabled aging and getting older. The benchmark in medicine is that if they can just keep you alive, that's kind of a positive thing. When you may not be able to walk five feet without gasping for breath, or you may not be able to get up out of bed because there's such incredible pain and you can't do anything. To me, that's not adding life to your years. And we want to add life to those years, not just years to those lives. And so we want to have a difference between living and lasting longer. I think it doesn't do us much good just to last longer if we can't have life added to that picture. Now, that brings up a model for me that I like to call functional aging. Because when we talk about lifestyle change, we're talking about responsible action and responsible choices. And frankly, in modern times in our culture today, that idea of somebody taking responsibility for their words and deeds doesn't seem to play much anymore. It doesn't seem to be something that's really honored in our culture. And it sounds, when I say the word responsibility, it almost sounds punitive in a certain way. So I'm going to change that word to what I call responsibility. To understand that, think about this. Imagine if you were a tightrope walker and I had to stretch a line across Niagara Falls, give you a pole and ask you to cross that, that tightrope. That tight you would have to make small, minute adjustments to all of the what? The breezes, the wind, all of those factors so that you could maintain your balance. The human body in life and health is much like that tightrope walk. It is constantly making minute adjustments to all the changes and shifts and chaos of the environment to be able to maintain the balance that we call health in the face of chaos and change. So when we talk about lifestyle factors, when we talk about eating well, doing better, doing more things in support of ourselves, we're talking about how does it improve our ability to respond to chaos and change. And in the process of doing that, it helps to make us more resilient. And in the, in the process of that, it improves our function and performance at any stage and age. And I contend to you and I state to you that if anything, any of these doctors and speakers talk about doesn't help you become more ability to respond, more able to respond, more resilient and more functional and improve your performance, then what we're saying is not worth anything. But I contend that these factors of lifestyle, these nutritional choices that we are gonna unravel are gonna do just that. They're gonna improve your performance athletically, sexually, cognitively, in your 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. And if they don't, then you need to challenge it and move on, all right? Now, once you do that, this is my track team. You can join my track team. You have to be at least eight years old for this track team. These are my girls. 
candidate. She really not my girl, so I was out there a couple of years. But this was what we're talking about. And you notice all the wraps and the knees are wrapped and the body's wrapped, but it doesn't matter because you're out there doing what you need to do and you're getting up in the morning and capable of pursuing and getting on with things. Now, in the late 1980s and early 90s, I had the unique opportunity to be on the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Texas in San Antonio, which at the time had the probably one of the most established and productive aging research clinics in the world. They pioneered much of what we now know about calorie restriction. And what I'm going to present in the rest of this talk today is going to come from what came out of much of that research that I was involved in and others, and I want to tie it together to the lifestyle that we're talking about. In all the years of aging research, there's been only one major manipulation in science that dramatically extends the lifespan of mammals, and that is calorie restriction. If you take any group of animals, in this case we'll take rats because that's what originally it was done with. If you give rats enough food to run around, play, nibble, reproduce, and do all of their rat-like things, <coughs> and then you calculate the amount of food that it took for them to do that, and you reduce it by 50% in calories, those animals will live, or 40% in calories, those animals will live about 50% longer. That would be like you and I adding 40 years to our lives by the simple act of calorie restriction. Now, in those studies, if you just restrict calories, I think you can appreciate that you may create nutritional deficiencies if you're taking food away. So those animals are supplemented to eliminate the variable of deficiency so that you can focus on the variable of calorie restriction. And what's intriguing about the animals is not only do they live longer, but they have a dramatic decrease in kidney, heart, and joint disease, which is common to all mammals, including us, as we get older. Now, what's intriguing about that is a plant-based diet in some ways mimics that model of calorie restriction in that what do we know about plant-based eating? Well, we know that it has the greatest nutrient density, macro and micronutrients, for the lowest amount of calories. Let's face it, vegetables and things want 100 to 300, 400 calories a pound. But here's the beautiful thing, because not only do they have lower calorie density, but they have the greatest nutrient density, building in the protection that those animals needed to avoid nutrient deficiency in the face of restricted calories. So in a way, the plant-based model kind of does that, and if you really wanted to look at what that would mean, in the model that came out of the original animal data, you'd have women on 1,000 calories a day and men on 1,500, and the truth of the matter is this is not important. People have tried this. There are calorie restriction societies. The truth of the matter is this program is about eating well, not less. And I'm going to show you that without doing that, that the plant-based approach will modify the major model that came out of the correlations with aging. So what we're going to talk about is how do we put the age in damage. And there are three things, because understand this, in all the years of calorie restriction, scientists have been mystified how that simple change in calorie amount could create such a remarkable increase in lifespan. And it blew the minds of scientists from the beginning of this research, which has gone on over 30 to 40 years. As it turns out, the correlations that come out of that research are that when they look at these animals, there are three things that come up that we're going to talk about today. Number one is the fact that there is less chronic inflammation in those animals. And we're going to talk about the impact on inflammation. Very important is that the cook and processing of oils will create an inflammatory and oxidative change that has become one of the leading models in the science of aging. And these animals have less of it. And finally, the interaction of sugars and proteins which create what we call dietary glycotoxins and systemic glycotoxins. So I'm going to show you today why when we eat in a plant-based manner, it actually eliminates the three correlates that are the strongest in how scientists think animals are living longer because of calorie restriction. 
So without even restricting calories, just by eating the way that we are recommending, you will embrace that opportunity. You will embrace that outcome. Now, when we talk about inflammation, understand something. Inflammation is a normal, healthy process of the immune system. Without inflammation, if you had tissue damage, you would not be able to heal that damage. Where it becomes an issue is when the lifestyle and nutritional factors create such constant irritation across time that that inflammation becomes chronic and outlives its usefulness. So when we talk about chronic inflammation, of course we are always talking about the fact that the standard American diet is not so much about deficiency, but it's about the excesses of protein, especially animal protein, saturated, transformed, and processed fats, and of course refined sugars. Now, these particular items all disrupt the acid alkaline balance of the body, understanding that the body in its foundation, in its basis, has somewhat of an alkaline environment. So if you look at the fluid in your joints, the fluid in the bloodstream, the urine, it is more optimum in a slightly alkaline range. But the building blocks of protein being amino acids, saturated fats and fats being fatty acids, and some of the chemical changes of sugar create a hyperacidic state. They create a metabolic acidosis of a kind. Now understand, that puts the body under a state of irritation. Now, if I stood up here and rubbed the back of my hand, at first that feels kind of nice, I don't do that much. But if I continue to do it, that area is going to get very irritated. If I go beyond that irritation and keep rubbing, that area is going to get red and inflamed. So when these acidic byproducts are flowing through that system over a period of time, what happens is you get more of that irritation and inflammation on the lining of blood vessels to the heart, the brain, and the body generally. You damage the inner lining of those vessels, which can lead to plaque formation that begins to cut off blood supply and oxygen to the heart, to the brain, to the organs at large. And now you've got a whole range of diseases that have become the pandemics of modern civilization. Heart disease, uh, dementia, diabetes, stroke, and the like. These are all diseases in their inception of exaggerated chronic inflammation. This just looks at junk food because that's become such a big component of the dietary pattern of our country. We're going to come back to this data, but this was just a nurse's health study that showed those nurses eating the greatest amount of that junk food, processed foods, processed fats, which we're going to come back to, had the greatest amount of inflammation. So it linked this dietary change to inflammation. Obesity is kind of intriguing. Because most of us don't understand that fat cells are not just inert cells. They're not just there making us look a little less attractive and making us look a little less uh, comfortable within ourselves. Fat cells are releasing a series of chemicals and what we call cytokines, like interleukin, tumor necrosis factors and the like, that will dramatically increase inflammation. So understand that body weight gain, body fat gain, is an inflammatory component. So any weight loss that occurs tends to be remarkably anti-inflammatory. Then of course there are negative emotional and stressful states, depression, anger, fear, chronically over time, that in the mind-body connection will also damage the lining of vessels, creating that potential block. And then finally, when we look at chronic pain, stiffness, and constriction, which we seem to have more of over time, that's related to this inflammatory process. So in a functional performance way, it's one of the reasons why you have many high performance athletes, many people now moving toward the vegan whole food plant-based approach because they find they have less stiffness, they find they have better performance, they find they have better recovery time when they're dealing with the results of their activity. Now, tied into that, is going to be the way we handle and process fat. And the fat story is probably one of the most dramatic and interesting of all. We know that the building blocks of fat are the compounds that we call fatty acids. And if you'll notice, all fatty acids have the same basic anatomy. They are basically a chain of carbon atoms where attached all around that chain is the element hydrogen. The important point is if every space on that chain is full, that chain is what we call saturated. Now, saturated fats tend to have a much lower melting point 
I mean, at much higher melting points, so and they tend to be solid in the temperature of the room. So when you see fat that marbles that meat, or you see a stick of butter on your shelf, you know that that's solid saturated fat, and of course that will increase risk in the temperature of the body, because at body temperature, it still tends to stay solidified. Very important. Now if I come along, and I remove hydrogen from that one of those areas of the chain, now I have spaces where something else can attach, and you see a double bond there now. To that extent, that chain is now unsaturated. Now unsaturated fats have a much lower melting point. So because they are unsaturated, those molecules are kind of moving apart, so they tend to be liquid in the temperature of the room. When you go down the oil aisle in your supermarket, and you see canola oil and olive oil and sunflower oil, what do those oils look like on the shelf? Liquid. Liquid. So you know that they're basically unsaturated. Now, that tends to be a little less risky in the body at body temperature. I'm going to show you that there's major problems with oil on several different levels that we're going to get to. But understand this now, and let me take you into one thing that I want to take you in briefly, because it's going to come back for you to understand what happens when oils are cooked, prepared, and processed. We have a human body that has trillions of cells. Every, every single cell of that body has to be able to live individually, autonomously, just the way that you and I do. So each cell sits by itself, and imagine you in a house with a picket fence around it. Each cell has a little fence around it, and a neighboring cell, and a neighboring cell, and a neighborhood of cells, and a community of cells, in a society of tissues and organs, and eventually the holographic reality of the body itself. But each of those cells in that huge society has to be able to live individually. Now, the fence of that cell, like the fence around your house that allows you to come in with groceries and food and allows you to take the trash out, that cell has to allow nutrients and things to enter, and it has to allow garbage and things to be removed. So I'm going to let you play God now, because the membrane of that cell is actually made up as a sandwich of fat and protein. Well, let me ask you a question. If you were going to put a fat in that membrane that would allow things to glide, slide, and dance, and move comfortably through that membrane and up and down that membrane, what kind of fat would you put in that membrane? Unsaturated. Because it's liquid, it's loose, it's mobile, it's youthful, it's able to allow all of that transit. So we're going to come back to that. Because you're going to see that the processing and cooking of fat alters that dynamic. It ages that membrane. It ages that sense. All right? Now, what happens then is that when fats are cooked, prepared, and processed, there are two things I want to discuss today, because there's many things we can talk about. But one is that we are going to change the architecture of that fat. I want you to think about this. Every molecule, every cell in the human body has an architecture. It has a three-dimensional structure, just like I'm a three-dimensional figure. <laughs> and in the body, when those fats in their architecture, you'll see here, you'll notice that right here we have hydrogen, two hydrogens below that double bond. This configuration in the human body is what scientists call the cis form. 90% of all the fats in the human body are in the cis form. Why? Because in that form, that fat is most mobile and most capable of allowing things to glide and slide and dance through that membrane. But when fats are heated in the presence of hydrogen, what we find is, number one, we hydrogenate those chains. You add more hydrogen back, but notice this. Where you had both of those hydrogens below that chain, now you have one above and one below. You have transformed that fat, you have changed the architecture into a trans fat. Now why is that important? It's important because to the human body, those fats look somewhat the same. And the body will put those fats in the membrane of cells, in the body of organs, in the wall of blood vessels. But they don't function the same because the architecture has changed. And we now know that when trans fats are put into a membrane, for example, a, a blood vessel, that blood vessel will not handle the pressure of blood quite the same. It will break down faster, leading to plaque formation faster. 
and it will then create more blockage and plaque and heart disease. We also know that when you have transformed fats, they will allow things to enter cells that they normally block, and they will block things that they normally allow. So we know when trans fats go up, you're more prone to bacterial and viral infections, for example. So understand the dynamic of how important just that change in architecture can be in the system. And I showed you that nurse's health study where the nurse is eating the most dramatic amount of processed, cooked, fats and oils in baked goods, french fries and the like, had the highest level of a protein that the body releases in the face of inflammation. When you're inflamed, your liver releases a protein called C-reactive protein. It's just a marker for inflammation. Noticeably, these nurses in that nurse's health study eating the most processed fat had the greatest amount of CRP and the highest levels of inflammation. Once again, Realize that inflammation is the foundation for most chronic disease and premature aging. So as those foods come in, as those fats change, you're increasing that potential for premature aging. Now, <clears throat> so when we talk about aging with fat, we're talking about the fact that the cis versus trans fats are changed and that affects membrane fluidity. It's almost thinking about the membrane of these cells becoming almost lard-like, solid. So things don't glide and slide and dance quite as comfortably through that. So it changes in membrane fluidity. And then once cells have that, their function is not going to be as good as it should be. Now, if you're eating plant-based, you're not adding oils, you're not cooking oils with high heat, guess what? You don't have this problem. But in our culture, think about how much refined and junk food and fats are consumed, and the fact that people are taking a good 80% of their protein and fat from animal sources. <clears throat> and finally, we have cellular aging that will occur because of that shift. Goes even a little bit further though. We also know that of those fatty acids, that uh, there are two of them <coughs> that are what we call essential, meaning that you and I can't make them, <clears throat> but they are critical for what we need to do. And they come, and many of you know the omega-6 and omega-3 families, but there's only two of them. One is linoleic acid and one is alpha linolenic. Why are they important? I made the point that the immune system has to balance the process of inflammation. I think you can appreciate that if you have tissue damage or in an injury, an accident, whatever, you're going to have tissue damage. So the body is going to have to exert an inflammatory response to clean that up. But I think you can appreciate that if that inflammation did not go check, was not regulated, that inflammation could outlive its usefulness and now become a problem in its own right. As it turns out, the chemicals that modulate, that really control that inflammatory process are a class of compounds that we call prostaglandins. Don't worry about the $5 name, but here's what you need to know. When we look at the family of omega-6, that linoleic can be converted into a much longer unsaturated fatty acid called arachidonic acid, which is the most dominant fatty acid in the membrane of all animal cells. Keep that in your mind. That includes meat, that includes chicken, that includes beef, that includes pork, that includes all animals. So in this process, what will happen is that as that linoleic is converted into arachidonic, Normally, we have enough linoleic acid in certain of the grains, greens, etc., for the body to make that fat that makes your membranes nice, smooth, and easy going. The problem is, when we look at arachidonic acid, the arachidonic is going to be at highest concentration in a variety of meat, dairy, milk products, and the like. Now, understand that if you have a culture where people are taking in 80% of their fats and protein from animal sources, you are going to drive the reaction of, of this form of this pathway to what we call increased inflammation. So generally speaking, as people decided to consume more animal-based products, they literally drove the inflammatory pathway that remarkably enhances that level of inflammation. 
On the other side of this equation, in the omega-3, you've got a lot of the plant sources like what? Well, like soy and whole grains and deep greens and avocado and my king of nuts, walnuts. But what's interesting about this pathway is, is that it tends to promote prostaglandins that are anti-inflammatory. So this is a very intriguing piece. Because if you look through the 20th century, from the time that immigrants came to America, they were very impoverished when they came to America. So what was their eating plan? Well, things that reflected their economic status. What did they eat? Grains, beans, seeds, pastas, things that were relatively inexpensive, but also that were on this anti-inflammatory omega-3 side of the equation. But as we evolved through the 20th century, our lifestyle and diet became a lifestyle and diet of affluence, adding more meat and dairy and refined sugar and the like, and guess what happened? We created an epidemic of diseases of affluence, which are what? Obesity, heart disease, cancer, and the like. So in a way, when you eat in the way we're recommending, you're moving back into kind of an immigrant, plant-based approach that is remarkably anti-inflammatory. And what we now know is that we need to have a dominance of that omega-3 food compared to these animal products. And if you're eating any animal products at all, they better be the amount that could fit in the palm of your hand in a week. And the salads and veggies need to be the size of a small hug. <laughs> now, when you do that, guess what happens? You shift the ratio in the direction that we need it. This is the Willy Wonka golden ticket. In the United States, if you look at the ratio of foods, omega-6 to omega-3, Americans are eating a diet that's about 15 to 30 to 1. That means it's dominant in incredible inflammatory foods. We're recommending a reversal of that ratio to about 1 to 2. So you're adding all of those seeds and nuts and plants and greens and whole grains and the like. And if you do that, if you reverse that ratio, that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, you've got a tool for remarkably blocking the production of inflammation in your life and preventing premature aging and disease across the board. All right? Now, we're going to take it. So to decrease inflammation, we're looking at a plant-based approach. We're looking about avoiding especially all high-protein diets which are getting their heyday again. High-protein and high-fat, not the way to go. Increasing the omega-3 rich foods, deep greens, walnuts, whole grains, chia seed, hemp seed, avocados, and the like. We're looking at decreasing omega-6 foods, mostly animal and dairy products. We're looking at maintaining the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of about one to two not 15 or 30 to 1. And we're looking at eliminating cooked and processed oils, junk food, and including all refined sugar products. Now, we're going to take it one step. And so in this process, we have lab markers. I'm just bringing them up briefly. One of the best, of course, is highly sensitive CRP, which is a good marker for inflammation. It's a cytokine that is released in the body. And I typically recommend doing that on every blood test that anybody that I ever recommend because it's a marker for early onset inflammation. You don't have to wait until the end of the road. People do things like cholesterol, which by the time you see it, it can already be some exaggerated and established heart disease. CRP will show up much earlier in the process. And then in relationship to aging and cognitive deficit, this is very important. And that, of course, is the issue of homocysteine, which is made from the amino acid we call methionine. And it is a profound vascular toxin associated with brain injury, brain atrophy, and loss of cognitive function. I, I measure this again on all people lab-wise. And just to give you a little background on some of those studies, for example, this Framingham study, which was done back in 2002, over an eight-year period, Alzheimer's disease doubled when the plasma levels of homocysteine went greater than 14 micromoles. Don't worry about the numbers, just know that around 12 to 14 is a cutting off point on some of these studies that you'll see. Another one here, you'll see that as homocysteine levels went up, there were more silent brain infarcts. That means damage to the brain from vascular occlusion, vascular blockage, what people call amyloid plaques. 
and a decrease in brain volume. We see a population study here that the highest levels of homocysteine were associated with the, low, with the most cognitive deficits. And finally, this one in 2016, which is really very profound, with the high levels of homocysteine that were generated by a methionine-rich diet. Guess what methionine comes from primarily? Fish, meat, dairy, eggs. Those are homocysteine-generating diets. Proteins from plant sources, legumes, beans, nuts and the like, have very low methionine, so they tend not to be homocysteine-generated. But in this study, as you'll see here, you'll notice that it increased with fibrin, it had all kinds of beta amyloid plaques, brain clots in humans, and they even did a mouse study where they did a methionine-stimulated homocysteine event in mice and saw the same thing. So it doesn't mean you're going to have Alzheimer's with high homocysteine. No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that it does somewhat correlate with the idea that they could be future brain damage or cognitive deficit. So I do it as a marker. Remember, these are markers. They're not definitive. They're correlative. They correlate with potential change. But the homocysteine one is interesting. Now, we're going to go one step further. We haven't been done with fat yet, and this is very important. Because we've talked about how the processing and cooking of fats and oils can be associated with inflammation. But there's something even more, and that is the, what we call the oxidation of fats and oils. And this is a dominant story in the science of aging. But I'm going to show you that it's a dominant story that is eliminated on a plant-based eating thing. Now, to understand this, you've got to understand our good friend oxygen. Now, as you know, oxygen is an elixir of life. When you eat carbohydrates, all the fruits and plants that you're eating in the presence of oxygen, you're able to create all the energy that you need to do all the things that we need to do everything that we do. So oxygen is linked with energy production. But think about this. If you leave a metal object out in your garage or out on your lawn, what happens to it over time? It starts to get kind of rusty. So oxygen is a double-edged sword. It can create and promote life but it can also promote and create damage. And why? Because oxygen, as an element, is very unstable. And now I'm going to bring you back to your favorite class in high school, high school chemistry. I know you all loved it. <laughs> I had a chemistry professor that told me when I was 15, he actually pulled me aside and told me I would never amount to anything. <laughs> well, he's dead, and I'll teach you chemistry. <laughs> Oxygen, without getting crazy, understand this. It lacks two <laughs> atomic particles that are called electrons. These are little negative clouds that swing around the core of oxygen. Is that important? Not really. Here's what's important. That because oxygen lacks those, it spends all of its waking chemical life trying to share, steal, or borrow those from wherever it can find them. If it finds them in your brain, it will rip your brain apart to take them. If it finds them in your heart, it will rip your heart apart to take them. And why does uh, oxygen want these electrons? Because oxygen, like all of us, is just looking for a stable relationship. <laughs> <laughs> now, the question I'm going to pose to you then is, since we've been dealing with oxygen since eons of time, why haven't we rusted away like some metal object in your garage? Because oxygen was able to do and combine with the most prevalent element in nature called hydrogen to produce the most dominant material in the human body and on planet Earth, which is what? Water. Well, what do you notice in the water molecule? This is what you should have been told. You'll notice that there's two atoms of hydrogen for every one of oxygen. So each of those hydrogens can donate one of those electrons that gives oxygen that stable relationship. So oxygen in the water molecule, it is match.com. <laughs> it's no mystery then why the body is 70% water, and planet Earth has the same water content as your body, 70%. And that's why I love in the Jewish tradition of the Kabbalah, they talk about water being the most direct expression of God on Earth. Kind of an interesting statement, because it does play when you see it this way. But understand something, though, and this is important. When you go through water metabolism, it's possible that as you break that water molecule apart, you can create 
chemical entities that have a free, unpaired electron with a negative charge. Now remember what we said, if they're lacking an electron, they're very reactive species because they want to find that mate, okay? They want to find that mate. And so what do you think we call any chemical with a free, unpaired electron? Free radical, beautiful. It's also called an oxidant. So what do you think we're going to call compounds and chemicals that get rid of oxidants? Antioxidants. Now, where do we find those? In the colors of fruits and vegetables. The greatest protection you have, and it's also the reason why the best diet you can consume is the one that has the highest water content. What diet is that? Fruits and vegetables and plant-based. This all ties together. Now, the increase in free radicals, and here's the important point. When this happens with unstable fatty acids, remember we said those are in your membranes. They're, they're those liquid, beautiful fats that allow things to move, but they're relatively unstable. So in the presence of this kind of radical presentation, you can produce the most dangerous free radical known to man, and that is going to be the lipid peroxy radical. And you know how that occurs? When you take this fat, right here, let's take a fat right here, you see how that little radical from water will extract that hydrogen, giving water off, and now you've got a, free, a lipid radical, and it goes through a cycle where you're just generating these dangerous lipid radicals. Why are they so dangerous? Because they're damaging the lining and membranes of all the cells in the human body. And what has the highest level of these dangerous or these unsaturated fatty acids, the membranes of all animal cells. So when they are exposed to high heat cooking, like the barbecuing of meat or whatever, you're generating the most dangerous free radicals known to man, especially this lipid peroxy radical. Just know that this is a kind of a thing that goes on and just propagates in a cycle, almost like a brush fire, when you expose these fats to these radicals. Remember, cholesterol in itself is not a problem. A radical form of cholesterol is a problem. These free radicals will damage cells, and you'll notice here, it says this process proceeds by a free radical chain reaction. It affects the polyunsaturated fatty acids in all the cells of the body, and it produces lipid byproducts that can produce cancer and premature aging. So we're coming up on 4th of July, barbecue and all that meat. I call that the free radical holiday. <laughs> and remember, any frying heat, any heat, we talk about heat, we're talking about 120 degrees or more. Most cooking heat is above three and 400. But understand this, lipid peroxidation is one of the dominant theories and hypotheses in the science of aging. It is literally called the lipid peroxidation theory of aging. And what I'm telling you is that the animals that live the longest in those aging studies have less of this, and you will have less of this when you are not dealing with fats and oils subjected to heat and cooking. I'm going to show you in another few slides and toward the end here that you don't want any oil added to that diet, and I'm going to make a case for that. But for right now, I want you to understand that, that on a basic level, the processing of cooking of fats dramatically increases the inflammatory component of aging, dramatically improves and increases the peroxidation, the oxidation, the oxidant nature of fat transformation that promotes remarkable aging. Now, that means anything that raises antioxidant content is going to help. And you'll notice here, I just gave a little slide. When you look at these blue zone cultures, those cultures that have people that live the longest, they have, uh, and we're looking at Okinawans, we're all Chinese, Sardinians, people off the coast of Greece called the Icarians. If you look at this chart, this is just a chart looking at the impact of the ability of any food to get rid of free radicals. Just a chart. And you'll notice that on this chart, things like beans and you know blueberries, they have these very high numbers. What they've discovered is that people that, that are living long are taking in about 20 to 25,000 of these oxygen radical absorbance foods units daily. Now, if you're eating any kind of regular plant-based approach, if you look at this, even a half a cup of beans is already 13,700. So if you're eating a plant-based approach, you're building in the antioxidant content that's putting you in the direction of the longest-lived cultures with the, the greatest loss of inflammation in the system. So I just put this up to show you how plant-based foods are building in that kind of antioxidant protection with these huge numbers 
artichoke hearts, blackberry, cranberry, just a small little thing. Now, last thing we want to discuss is one of the, my most profound and something that I spend some of my own research time with, and that is what we call the sugaring of protein. Now understand what I'm going to tell you next. When sugar enter, when we look at protein, protein is made up of building blocks called amino acids. We, most people know that. They're kind of like a string of beads. Think about a string of beads where the beads are amino acids. But proteins are very complicated, so they don't have one string of beads. They have a number of strings that are wound together, braided like a rope. Think about that. But here's the interesting thing. For a protein to function properly, those strands of beads, those strings, have to vibrate and move at a frequency similar to what you would see on the strings of a guitar when you play. So each protein, each strand of beads, is vibrating like a musical note to function efficiently. It's a very dynamic process of protein dancing, vibrating, and playing the music that they were created to play. When they are exposed to high sugar, you have something that is called the glycation of protein. Sugar will cross-link those strands of protein, making them unable to vibrate and dance the way that they were created. And if you look at the next slide, it's a complicated slide, but just look at the top gray boxes. Sugar plus the amino acids of protein produce a series of compounds that are called advanced glycation end products, A-G-E age because we now know that that sugaring of protein creates an endless array of aging outcomes in the body like what the effects of AGEs, the cross-linking of protein a loss of protein function that means hormones enzymes which are all proteins will not function to their capacity it means that digestive enzymes that are all protein will not operate and work nearly as well so as the sugar levels go up in the body, and that happens with a lot of the refined nature of what we're eating, you're generating more of this AGE effect, which will lead to systemic inflammation, damage in the skin, damage in the eyes. You know, as you get older, how your skin seems to be less elastic and bouncing back. That seems to be an AGE effect on the collagen in the skin. It's, it's cross-linking that protein. Cataract formation can be the lens protein being sugared and cross-linked so that it's not functioning the same way. Aged skin, cataract and plaque formation. The formation of beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles in Alzheimer's are part of the AGE effect. And that's something that we have to address with dementia and the like. Neurofibrillary tangles just means that as the brain moves into Alzheimer's, the fibers in the brain become like spaghetti that you make without adding enough water or a little bit of salt to it. It gets clumped. It gets all tangled like your hair does if you're trying to take a shampoo sometimes and you're going to brush it out. The fibers in the brain get stuck like that hair that needs to be unraveled with a brush. It gets tangled. And when it gets tangled, information can't move through it. So you lose whole portions of the brain. But make no mistake, this sugaring effect so we see this much greater in people with things like diabetes, for example, where they're running higher blood sugars across time, and the kidney damage and heart damage associated with that can be very much directed at how this sugar is sugaring protein. But it goes even a step further, because we now know that foods that are high in fat and protein and some sugars are not only generating, you're not only getting that sugar effect in your blood, we now know that foods have a content of AGEs. Now, AGE content in food is measured in what's called KUs, kilounits. And I only put this up because I want to really make a point so you can see how clearly this is connected to the plant-based eating pattern. You'll notice that the AGE content, look at apples. It's 13, just for the sake of argument. Cantaloupe, 20. Don't worry about the units, just look at the number. Tomato, 23. Look at butter, 23,340. Whenever the fat content goes up in the food and it gets more processed, the AGE content goes through the roof. You'll look at tall cucumber, 31. Cream cheese, 10,000. Carrots, 10. Boca burger, only 100, but look at do I have it here, a turkey burger? Big Mac, 7,801. 
Here's an interesting piece that should put the bed to rest the oil story forever. Look at olives, 1,670. Tides of fat containing food. But look what happens when you turn it into olive oil. 11,900. It's a tenfold, and that can go up from tenfold to a hundredfold. There is no place in the diet for added oils. None. Zero at any time under any conditions. Because not only does it provide a calorie density that's problematic, which we know of, but this is a very telling point that as you get more processing of fats and oils and protein, the age, AGE content, those glycosylated end products, go way up. Look at fried bacon, 91,577 compared to 23 for a tomato. You think there's a place for bacon on the program? I don't think so, <laughs> unless you want to age rapidly. Now, what the science shows is that diets that generate more than 12 to 15,000 KUs daily are already severely age promoted. So I think you can appreciate that as you're eating more plant-based, you're not getting any, look, even an Amy's veggie burger, which may have a lot of salt, only 198 compared to a Big Mac, which is 7801. And these are both skillet baked, skillet produced. So uh, if you look at even tofu steamed, it's 628, but look at tofu fried, 4,723. So you're noticing something here that we're going to wrap up with the following slide, and that is, these are the tips to reduce AGE consumption and prevent premature aging. Number one, we're going to eliminate foods high in AGE. What's that? Well, we're going to start getting rid of all sugary items, candy, cookies, cake, soda, pastries, especially fructose and high fructose corn syrup. The fructose and fructose corn syrup will promote 10 times the glycation of glucose. We're going to talk about getting rid of all processed foods, especially packaged meats and cheeses. <coughs> cheeses are by far one of the worst foods for AGE production. With all the other things we know that are negative about cheese, this is a devastating component for aging. We're going to get rid of high fat, especially high fat meats and red meats for sure. We're going to get fats including butter, margarine, and oil. The butters, margarines, and oils are the worst age-producing foods that you can possibly consume. Then we're going to talk about all fried foods that can go. Because you're going to see that it's the cooking process that helps it. And what are we going to add? We're going to consume plant-based foods low in AGEs, which are all of the fruits and veggies, whole grains and legumes, all of the low-fat breads, whole grain pastas, veggie burgers, and then from a cooking standpoint, we want to change cooking methods. You'll notice that if you use a slow cooker and cook for less time with moist heat, the AGE production in food will go down. In fact, it can go down as much as 10 to 100 times compared to not to dry heat, frying, grilling, and broiling, all right? We're also talking about cooking foods in water or broth through boiling, steaming, light sauteing, and poaching. You see that cooking process really affects how you're generating these age-producing chemicals. And sometimes if you are eating animal packs or foods with high fat, if you marinate them in acidic or citrus-based sauces like lemon, balsamic vinegar, or tomato juice or sauce, the AGE content will significantly reduce. So understand that as we talk about this, when you eat in a whole food plant-based manner, there are some things that we know about what is correlated with aging. And we see those in animals that under calorie restriction live the longest. But what is really quite apparent is that as we go through a plant-based approach, the best that we know in science for those factors that are linked with early, with, with longevity or, or lack of long life are eliminated completely by the use of a whole food plant-based approach. And once again, that's getting rid of all of the inflammatory stuff, getting rid of the glycotoxins and all of the effects of fat. Look, and the race of this age, aging is really something that is something all in front of you. I love the line by Satchel Paige, an old famous baseball player. He said, don't look back, something may be gaining on you. <laughs> the race is forward, nobody knows where the finish line is, but I will guarantee you this. By embracing the whole food plant-based lifestyle and other hygienic factors, you will be able to achieve the grace, the beauty, the function, and the productivity that you would love to have at any age across time. Thank you so much.
I've been working on my impression of Frank. So. <laughs> I've been putting up with this for 40 years. <laughs> it never stops. We do go way back. And, uh, it's a funny story that uh, one, of the, one of the legendary doctors of our business was uh, in the health movement was Dr. D.J. Scott at Cleveland, who has transformed the lives of so many, so many that are here. And, 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 uh, the Dr. Scott was me, he was in Strongsville, Ohio. And, uh, but Dr. Scott, I wouldn't say, had the greatest bedside manner that you ever saw in your life. I mean, he, it was his way or the highway. But Frank really began his career in this business by doing an internship for about a year with Dr. Scott. And my mother and my father, the closer my mother was a patient of Dr. Scott's, who would go up there and fast from time to time, and she would please pray that Frank would do the rounds instead of Dr. Scott. <laughs> she adored him forever. I think she always, even though he's Italian, she always considered him a lot of Jewish descent. I think it's from New York or something, you know? A lot of mushy dust. So, all the Tsaurus, too, as we say in Jewish. So, one of the unique things about today's speakers in particular, and most of the people that we have here in the conference, is you can go to health conferences all over the country and hear great speakers on health. But one of the unique things that we have always offered in the NHA, the Old American Natural Hygiene Society, is that the doctors you see, the doctors you learn from, are doctors you can also see as a patient if you have a health problem or just want guidance or have a, a question about raising your children or, or taking care of your parents. The unique thing about the NHA t today, especially today, but historically, is that those are the kind of doctors that we present to you. Dr. Sabatino is one of those guys. And his Balance for Life retreat in Florida, and they have a very special opportunity for you. His Balance for Life program takes place at, in Deerfield Beach, the Wyndham Hotel. It's a beautiful facility. My wife and I were down there. We did a little feature in it in, in the last issue of Health Science. It's a great place to just, whether you want to water fast or just relax or eat or just spend time with Frank, you know, dancing on the beach. He'll do Tai Chi with you and all that. They have an offer that is, he and his business partner, Harold Lubavik, who's here, that a brochure is in every one of your pamphlets for Balance for Life. But they have offered here at the conference a $200 gift certificate for Balance for Life that you can buy here at the conference for $25. Now, limit two, and I don't know what, there are a few restrictions on it, but not many, but Harold is here. But you can buy them, and the nice thing that Harold and Frank are doing, they're donating with $25 is to the NHA. So, so that's a hell of an opportunity. Thank you, Harold. And Harold, if you have any questions about it, you can ask Harold. But again, the great thing that uh, we have here today is all the speakers that you're going to hear today uh, are people you can actually see. And it will be Frank and the next guy we have, Anthony Lim, is in Trudeau. Ace and Joanna Frey, if you want to journey down to Puerto Rico, you can, you can stay with them. Al Goldhammer will be speaking later. He is the, he is the Trudeau Health Center. Joel Kahn will be speaking later this afternoon. Woo! Joel Kahn from Michigan. Hey. Many of you are patients of his here. Well, that's great. Joel is a guy that people consult and see. And last but not least, today is Gracie. Where's Gracie? Mark, I just Gracie's wanted you to know, I'm actually fighting the head dietitian at the Cleveland Clinic by like messaging right now. There you go. And she won't come here because she's afraid to learn about plant-based nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> it's so actually true and insane. And Gracie Ewan, who, who is, who's uh, taken over the legacy of Dr. Scott in West Farmington, Ohio, just about an hour from here, uh, Gracie someone you can see. But again, uh, again, these are all people you can see, talk to, get well, and uh, be guided by, and they're really phenomenal. The next guy that I'm going to introduce is really, really special. 